I'm Devon Guillory, and I'm here to break the silence. Shh! Content warning. This video contains sensitive discussions about prejudice, discrimination, and racism. It was an introduction to something I was unprepared for, but it was definitely something I, I, that I don't believe could have been explained to an eight-year-old, like what I saw. Hi, I'm Roman Davis, and I'm back with another episode of Break the Silence. I'm sitting here with Dee, and Dee, why did you decide to break the silence today? Decided to break the silence today because I feel as though um, my story can inspire somebody. Okay, I like that. Well, who are you here to inspire? Tell us a little bit more about that. Uh, well, I'm here to inspire whoever cares to listen and whatever, you know, if my story resonates with them, okay. then hopefully they can take something from it. Uh, my story starts off uh, being raised by my mother. I did at one point have my mother and father um, in the household, but my father ended up getting locked up and uh, the weight of raising a child fell on my mother. Mm. Um, I think at the, the age of 20. So with that, you know, she has to work. Now when you're, you're working, you, you're not there to kind of look after your kids. So I stayed with my grandmother at times. Now my grandmother's was really cool because uh, all my cousins were there. I was a real introverted, shy kid. So whatever neighborhood we were living in, I didn't have many friends. But when I went to my grandmother's house, that's where my cousins were, it was fun. Mm. Uh, so I went there every so often. Um, and then there were times I went over there and I was just kind of by my, not by myself, but my cousins weren't there, weren't present. So there was one moment, I think I was roughly eight years old, and uh, we were, it was me and my uncle, my grandmother's in the back room, we were watching Jurassic Park on VHS. Uh, for some reason, I don't, I'm not really clear why, uh, we paused the movie or something. And while I'm there, I'm, I hear what appears to be like grown man screams, right? Never heard grown man screams before. I'm watching Jurassic Park, mm. <laughs> but these watching sound a little more surround sound, yeah. you know. So, uh, being interested, I ran over to the window, and um, I was watching something in the distance. Probably I don't know, hundred feet away or something, but I could see it. It was at mm -hmm. nighttime, scuffling. But I heard a grown man crying out for his life. Never heard it before. Uh, knowing what I know now, I know I was watching someone being stabbed to death. This person who ended up getting stabbed to death, not only did the, uh, the people who did it ran off, but this person walked up and fell out right in front of the window where I was looking. And he died right in front of me at age eight, right? So I'm sitting here watching this whole thing like a movie because at eight, I don't know really what I'm watching. I was watching a movie with people dying. This looks like a movie as well. So I couldn't really connect the dots. My grandmother comes in and sees me looking out the window. She literally grabs me by my eyeballs and gets me out of the window. Tells me not to go back there. Yeah. Uh, with that, we never talked about it. It never got discussed. It never got brought up um, at all. It just kind of got, I want, for lack of a better term, swept under the rug. Mm -hmm. uh, and I didn't know then that it would affect me later on. I was just gonna say, how do you, I know we're going to get there, but just for, just quickly, how yeah. do you think that's really affected you? I mean, age eight to watch someone die before your eyes. I mean, it's a, well, it's a different experience because uh, that same plot of land where they died at was the same plot of land I played on. So it's one of those okay. things where it's like oh, I play out there, but someone died out there. So it kind of showed me like that world that we lived in, there's two sides to that coin mm. of that neighborhood. Like we live here, but this also happens here. And ever since then we made a conscious decision, uh, at least myself as a kid, not to play on that plot of land. Even though our grandmother said, well play where we can, I can see you. And normally it was underneath the window, but not anymore. Yeah. It just was out of the question. So was that like that traumatic event, do you think that shaped some of the relationships you were able to make after that? Or do you think it just kind of affected your overall viewpoint of that area? Because obviously, that, like you said, it was two sides of that coin, yeah. you know what I mean? So I guess just, uh, just tell us the immediate effects from that, because it, being age eight, I mean, I'm not sure if you remember it, but that is, that's hard, man. That's it's, It was an introduction to something I was unprepared for, but it was definitely something I, I, that I don't believe could have been explained to an eight-year-old, yeah. like what I saw. And um, I can say at that time, it showed me that, you know, the streets are hard. Mm -hmm. 
the same the same place I can go out and play at. You know, it, once that street light curfew or the street lights go down, like it turns into a different place. And where did your grandmother live? She lived in uh, like Roxbury, okay, like, uh, around right. there. Um, so yeah, and then the other thing is, you know, with that happening or, or that that occurred, uh, I was also um, I had an outlet. This is what I was very thankful for. Every Every moment that I encountered that might have offered some trauma, I actually had an outlet to help me deal with it. And I didn't connect the two, but they, it worked. And um, at that time, I was, uh, I, Boston Ballet had came to my school. They had uh, chosen me and they used to pick me up from school like twice a week, mm -hmm. middle of the day. I miss a couple of classes, don't have homework, you know. I'll run, jump, leap, all types of stuff. It's okay. It's fine. Uh, and... And doing that, it exposed me to a bunch of different things that I probably would have never encountered being where I'm from. It exposed me to classical music, exposed me to the piano, exposed me to different disciplines, flexibility. And it was also reassuring to see that, you know, uh, when you think of ballet, you think of girls in tutus, but I've seen other guys there as well. Mm -hmm. So it made me feel a little bit more comfortable. But I'm not telling everybody else back at the hood that I'm doing <laughs> hey, ballet. ballet. You know, because this stuff already happens. The last thing I need is to, you know, Ballet is not the, you know, the number one dancing type of uh, craft or, or, or art form that is accepted. <laughs> at yeah. the hood. So I kind of kept it to myself. But um, and and having that, it opened my world up so much to things I would have never touched if I just stayed put. And I was gonna say, isn't that sad? That Very sad. Things that truly make people grow and show them different life experiences that you can't even share that sometimes with other people because of the fear of judgment, of you know not being accepted, whatever it might be. Um, because I was just gonna say to you, I mean, that, that is something that's very individual. Like I've never, you know, growing up, if my friends did ballet, they never told us, you know what I mean? And I don't know if they did it or not. But now, now you make this point, I think it does expose you to different aspects of life that you never would be able to see, like you just mentioned. Um, so yeah, so talk to us about when you had those exposures to the different things that you maybe not have, um, wouldn't have had in, at your typical school, what were some of the things that really helped you out? Um, I would say to be social or to find other people in a different area where you weren't forced to be there. Mm. Like I feel as though when you're in school, sometimes you're forced to be in a classroom. Uh, a lot of the times that, can, that might not be a strong point. Um, you may not connect, me and you may not connect because we both love English, you know? <laughs> but it just so happens when I was in these other spaces where it stopped becoming, uh, where people would come and pick you up, you now had the option to go yourself. The people that were making the conscious decision to show up that was their space, that was their voice, that was their livelihood for those two, three hours. And we all talked about the same thing passionately. It didn't, it, it didn't matter you know, where I came from or we didn't have to talk about anything like hood related or whatever it was. It was just more like we talk about dance and that helped because it gave me a sense like there's more to talk about. And I don't have to, uh, I don't have to live up to anybody's expectation because what's expected of you it's the dance. Yep, exactly. <laughs> it's exactly. pretty straightforward. And I could say with that, what it did is it helped keep me out of a lot of trouble for a little bit of time. Now, I was, uh, it exposed me to a bunch of different things. Like I was able to perform for thousands of people at the Wang Center. It took me to the top of the hub opening night. Like wow. things I would have never had an yeah. opportunity to touch. What age was that, by the way? Uh, before, I was, before I was a teenager. Okay. I was a professional dancer, I want to say like five, six years. Wow. And on top of that, I got paid for it. So now I'm getting paid to do my art yeah. at an early age. My first paycheck was from dancing. Now I have to ask this. Can you still do anything for... I can, but I will not perform I'm, It's today. okay. Not today. <laughs> not today. Next time. Um, uh, I, I had to ask that. I just yeah, need to know. But it kept me out of a lot of trouble. Um, and then at one point in time, I left ballet alone. Uh, and there was this area of me not doing any type of art. Uh, you know, I would constantly draw and I found that whenever I drew, drew anything, I kind of stayed to myself and I was just in my notebook. I said that I didn't share my drawings much or whatever it was, but this is when I was just with the general public. When mm -hmm. I was with my family, they knew me as D, you know, fun loving D. But when I was out and about, this was my outlet, this was my voice. Uh, now I got into some trouble, no law involved, but <laughs> some trouble. We ended up moving to, uh, I think it was, I was in Dorchester and then our 
our house burnt down. And we had to, we separated for a little bit and then we came back and I moved to Mattapan, which they call Murdapan. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of like, that was the area that raised D from a young age and, and, and onward. Uh, now there, I was able to get into some trouble here and there, you know, mom might've came home to a stolen bike in the living room or something like that, told me to bring it back, you know, just kid stuff. But it wasn't until my godmother, God rest her soul, uh, connected me to um, an organization called BYCC. It was a mural crew. And that was the first time that I was able to see I could take something off the small piece of paper and I can enlarge it on the side of a building. And it's not just for me, it's for everybody from that area to be like, proud of something I contributed. And on top of that, I was able to connect with other individuals that that was their passion as well. So that communication, that conversation, that relatability was, um, we didn't have to speak much to know that we were on the same page. And that was very important, uh, especially being an introvert, a shy person and such. And that alone kept in, on top of that, it put money in my pocket. Yep. Now given those other people that worked at BOICC, I'm not sure if you're out there, but they were out there where they were like in the field and having to pick up trash. And I would see them and I'm like, oh man, like I'm painting walls and stuff. I'm like, you know, I'm pretty lucky, you know, because I'm doing this, I'm doing something I love. They don't look like they, they're loving it, but they're doing it for money. I'm doing something I love for money. And I'm getting paid so I, for it. And I'm, I'm gonna stick with it. Yep. You know, so um, art kept me out of trouble in that sense and they put money in my pocket so I didn't have to go out in the streets and go get it. But also I think it goes back to when you were a younger child to be exposed to a different you know, form of dance that was so outside the normal day to day that you were experiencing at that yeah. time that it was able for you to kind of take those things like creating murals and you know, luckily you, know, you had that connection to be able to, go, to, be able to do that. Um, so I think you know, what's, what's important I think that we share about your story is um, you've had a lot of trials and tribulations um, through your time coming up and um, I think there are some, is a particular story that I would like you to share with um, our audience um, regarding just a situation that happened on the street that you live. Um, and the reason I bring this up at this time in the video is I think we're giving people a, a really good viewpoint of the full person who Dee is but at the end of the day, there are some things that have happened that have shaped you to the man that you are right now in front of us, right? So let's share that story because I want to make another connection later in this, later in this conversation. Oh, to you it. got plans. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, always, always planning, always planning. Uh, if, if we're talking about, um, so where I lived was a very weird street. I wouldn't change it for the world though. Uh, I lived about, I want to say, four houses from Blue Hill Ave which after 6 p.m. Blue Alive was a completely different place to be. Yep. At the top of my street, there was a, uh, a project building. And about every summer, every other summer, it might get raided every now and then. In the middle, it was like the suburbs. Everybody knew everybody. It was all family oriented, but just at the ends, it was just different. Very, very different. So uh, I get a call uh, basically saying that, um, one of my dear friends has been shot. Uh, drive-by. Now drive-bys aren't likely. They don't happen often where I was at, but it happened that day. And it just so happened my friend got hit. So as we're running up the street and everybody that's there uh, that is familiar with my friend, they're, they're frantic around him. The ambulance don't, doesn't show up just yet. The cops show up first. And while everybody is frantic because we don't know what to do because he's laying out on the ground, uh, the cop felt the need to share, you know what, if you guys weren't out here, this wouldn't have happened. Mm. It's like 9 p.m. in the summer, and we live here. So what do you mean if we weren't here, this wouldn't have happened? It was a very insensitive thing to say to a group of people that were trying to address a bigger problem. Yeah. And, uh, and I can say little things like that kind of made me question, what makes you feel as though that's okay to share? Like, what point were you trying to get across? Uh, what was the point of it, period? You know, so um, it automatically made us give a different type of energy to that police officer. You know, now we're looking like the mad bunch, but mm -hmm. you said something very insensitive. So um, yeah, from that point on, just, I started, well even before that, I started paying attention to what people said and also how they said it, uh, because something that I've encountered uh, numerous occasions is that people will let you know how they feel if you just let them talk. Mm -hmm. 
And depending on who you are, or, or in my case at times because of my skin complexion, they couldn't figure out who I, who I was or they couldn't see if I was white, black, Spanish, whatever it was, I was able to really hear some things that kind of had me like, really? Mm. You, that's how you feel? So uh, just to even go back f further for a second, yeah. when I went to, uh, when I was in fourth grade, um, I had a teacher uh, and she said some words to me that completely shaped who I am. Um, where I, I went from first and third grade, honor roll student, got sent to an enrichment program. I'm in the enrichment program, and for some reason, I'm not sure what I was doing, but uh, the teacher took me aside and looked me in my face and told me, I'm never gonna be shit. And at that moment, at the time, I'm too young to grasp on to the idea like, this is wrong, but I don't like the feeling it gave me. Mm. So it, uh, this is the first, I think one of the first times I told my mom, because uh, it just didn't feel right. And I found it funny that a person that, my mother, is, my mother is leaving me in your care, in your guidance, which you, as a teacher, as an educator, whatever you're doing, you're supposed to be pouring life into me, pouring something in that I can use in the future. And you chose to use that I'm not gonna be shit. What can I do with that information? Um, but luckily, my mom was able to come in and address that. And that was the first time I've ever seen someone silently cuss, not silently, calmly cussed out and I was very prideful because it showed that someone had my back. And it wasn't that, uh, you know, the thing that people fear, the angry black woman, mm -hmm. you know, that when honestly they're just passionate about what they're talking about, or they're defending their kid or whatever it was. But she was very straightforward and she handled it. And from that point on, I didn't have any problems with that teacher anymore. And I became yeah. something. You know? Well, I, I really appreciate, one, you sharing both of those stories. I think, again, that um, gives an example of how interactions or small things that people think they can say really shape a person and how they view the world, right? So you mentioned something else regarding uh, skin complexion. Yes. Um, and I think we need to have a bigger conversation of what you mean when people <laughs> say, when you said skin complexion, they're not sure who I am, if I'm black, white, if I'm you know, Hispanic, whatever it might be. Um, what has been your experience regarding skin complexion and what do you feel comfortable sharing with us today? Mm. I can say when I first went to high school, that's when I found out I felt like other. You know, like when you get the cup, you say, like, is this a cola, is this a juice? I was other. Mm. Because when I walked into high school, I, was, I wasn't white enough to be white. Uh, I didn't look white enough to be white. I didn't look black enough to be black. Uh, if someone spoke to me in Spanish, I can count to 10. <laughs> but after that, they knew I wasn't Spanish. So they kind of distanced themselves as well. So. I was kind of just to myself for the most part because either they, they didn't ask many questions to find out who I was. Mm. So I just was to myself about my grades and just treated kind of school like a job in and out for the most part. But once again, I had my art. And then it wasn't until uh, people started noticing um, my artistic abilities where certain people would speak up yeah. uh, and such. They, they use it as a bridge of communication because I wasn't saying it for myself. But um, yeah, and I think art had no color. You know, you didn't have to guess. As funny as that sound, I mean, color, but yeah. art had no color. So um, yeah, my, my art was always my voice, my representation of myself. You know, I, I bump into people nowadays and they're like, oh, you're the guy that always used to draw on the back of the bus because I would never talk to anybody. I would just always draw, 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 draw. Uh, so yeah, that, I just experienced being isolated at times until I found a voice or until I found a way to just say, this is who I am, accept me or not. And um, in high school, I didn't find a voice till a lot later. I ended up, while in Mattapan, there was a music store called Mattapan Music. And because of Mattapan Music, I was able to talk. It, it, I was able to talk about something, uh, well, I guess I'll retract. I feel as though everybody has something quirky about them that they keep to themselves. And it's always awesome when you find out someone else is just as quirky about that, yep, right? Yep. So being at Mattapan Music, no matter how dangerous or how hood it could possibly be, the people that would come through those doors, they came there for one reason, music. Old, young, uh, you know, sweet and shy, thug and guilty, <laughs> whatever it is, they all came there and we all shared a common conversation just about music. And it kind of just let me know if people took the time just to speak about something, 
then there might be less differences. These are people I would have just walked past on the street, but in the store, music is this in all our lives. You know, that's interesting you say that. So every conversation that I've had on Break the Silence so far, um, for the most part, everyone has said, if you just listen to people, if you just give them a chance, if you just show some respect, you'll be surprised in all the things you have in similarities compared to differences. And, you know, I hope that the viewers that have hopefully watched all these episodes, right, mm -hmm. can really take that home and say, if I just was nice to somebody, if I just said hello, if I um, pa uh, was it pay it forward, you know, all that, all that cool stuff, the world would be a better place, the world would be yeah. a happier place. Um, so I want, I want to go on one more thing, is that around skin complexion, um, you know, I, I think it's been a difficult conversation for some to have, is because it, it is, it's a touchy subject. It's just like, you know, talking about racism and things of that nature, but people don't really talk about colorism in their own black community, right? Mm -hmm. And the comparison that we all have to ourselves and to others and, um, you know, hear from, uh, let's say, seniors and things like that, people in our culture that uh, have experienced that times 10 back in the day, but it's still something we feel today. Uh, what has been your experience regarding skin color? And I know you talked about complexion, you know, briefly, um, but you know, what is, what has been D's? My overall. Overall, yeah. That's a lot to sum up. Um, I'm gonna say my overall, I can only speak about my own experiences, what my own experiences, it, it has allowed me to observe how people treat who I consider my people, and my people black, brown, all people, but where I come from, black and brown people. Um, it also has given me the, uh, it's put me in certain situations where people that aren't black uh, feel like, well, they would share something that wasn't racist or could, be a, could come off as racist, but because I'm not super dark skinned, maybe they feel comfortable, so I call it diet racist. Mm -hmm. Like it was just enough of racist to kind of make me go, really? Um, like really, did you say that? Yeah. To me? And um, yeah. I've encountered it a couple of times and it always made me question like what made them say it or what made them act out or, or do whatever they did. Uh, just a quick couple of things, you know, I, the teacher in college, I, I mean, you see we're, Good looking gentleman on the stage, right? You know, I mean. second best looking guy on the stage right now. <laughs> but uh, the teacher told me, and she said, you know what, D would really do nice in the world if he cleaned up a bit. Mm. And she said this in front of my other professors. I was dressed nice, but the only thing that was different is I had braids. So you're here. That was it. Yep. But I never questioned it. I just kind of was like, oh. So, uh, and then later on in life, I was starting a company and uh, I was doing something with my business partner. And I always made sure because I, I am the lightest one out of all the artists I represented at the time, I was the forefront because a lot of the times we wouldn't get opportunities or certain opportunities uh, just because of the, I don't know, perception that, oh, they're dark skin, maybe they don't do as good work or maybe they don't work as hard. So I was kind of like that front to, to have those conversations. And we were, uh, you know, we were, trying to scale and in trying to scale we kept hitting like roadblocks either you're getting hired by your own people that want discounts whatever it is uh so we ended up talking to a fellow peer of mine so don't take offense to this if you watch this but mm -hmm. they said something to me that had me like this is part racist but also part truth where he was like hey guys um i'm starting this company very similar to ours if you guys want to come on board with us uh with me I'm pretty sure we can make some more money because I'm white. And we kind of chuckled, a little diet racism there, yep. but it was also a little bit of truth to it. A little bit it. of facts. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. And we just kind of had to swallow that. But with that, I said, even though that was his truth, I'm not gonna have it be my truth. So we had to work twice as hard, et cetera, et cetera. And it wasn't until I got into um, just the, uh, I got hired by a record label and I started doing amazing stuff. A lot of my career like catapulted, my design stuff catapulted from there. But I would sit there and look at invoices. I would sit there and look at what these other photographers, and graphic designers, and other creatives are getting paid out here. Why can't we get that? You know, what, why isn't that possible? Why isn't that opportunity happen? What's the quote? It's that you have to work twice as hard to get half as much Pretty as much. Um, being a person of color. Pretty much. And, you know, I, I, I would also I commend you a lot for sharing this because I think it's a conversation that we don't have 
nearly as much, especially in the black community. Um, and you know, I always make a little bit of a joke, but you go on, um, you know, go on Instagram, you go on social media, and you see blips of it, but you also see sheer ignorance when it comes to the comparison that people have sometimes between, they say, dark skins and light skins, right? Which is just so, oh, it's just ridiculous, because either way, you're, you're still from the same culture, you're still black people, or you're still a person of color, it doesn't matter what your complexion is, but it matters so much, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, and you know, I think, like you just said, speaking similar, we have similar complexions. I think we've had some similar experiences. Um, but I, I, I want you to be able to kind of sum this up for us and say, if you're watching this video today, we talked about many different topics, right? Finding your passion, finding your art, um, dealing with difficult police situations, dealing with seeing a death, um, dealing with tough skin complexion conversations, see, seeing the fact that people would pick a lighter skinned person over a dark skinned person have vastly different expectations or, or, or just as you just said, partner with a white person because that's gonna make them more money, right? Mm -hmm. So we talked about a lot of different subjects and a lot of different topics, but if you're watching this video and we're summing it all up, what do you want the viewer to walk away with today? Uh, I would say, while you can inspire before you expire, um, parents, Try not to put your pressures on your kids. Like, don't put too heavy pressure and expectation on your kids. And if they have a dream or if they have a goal, if they have something that they're naturally passionate about, you need to invest in it uh, as much as possible. Even if they're jumping ideas, just invest in it because all it's doing is building character. And I felt, and I and I felt as though, and you you hinted on it earlier. I always had to leave to acquire these experiences. And it wasn't until I got older that I was like, you know what, I wanted to do something in my neighborhood for people with this voice or with the voice or needed an outlet, some form of therapy and such. So I guess I would say, find your voice, not the voice that you talk with, not the voice that you speak with, but find something that you do for yourself that, and find a way to contribute and do it often. And, um, and then watch, what comes back from that? Because there's, there's a different level of love and that, that comes from sharing that energy. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and, and just don't, don't block your own light for the most part, you know? I, um, you know, I think one thing you just said, inspire before you expire. Um, absolutely. That is, that's powerful. And I think you've just not only have inspired everyone that's in you know, the studio right now, but everyone that's gonna be watching. And the fact that you've jumped, because I don't think the viewer really knows who you are, right? The fact that you've jumped from producer yeah. to now breaking the silence, I hope it really speaks to the fact that we are trying to get every single person in here to lift their voices and share. And I commend you for again, for sitting down here and telling your story, because it is a hard story to tell. Um, and I also, you know, again, I think if we had 30 more minutes, I, we could dive into a lot more. Oh yeah, we could. <laughs> but um, I think, what, I think we, it's a good time to sum it up. And, Again, I appreciate you coming here today to break the silence. I appreciate you um, being so raw and real about some of these stories. And you know, I really hope that if once this does premiere, I hope the viewer can uh, resonate and connect with it uh, because I think a lot of individuals can see uh, themselves in any of those stories that you've told. Uh, or if they can't see themselves, they know someone that has been through one of those uh, stories that you've told. So, um, you know, to the viewer, thank you for watching. To you, thank you for being here. And I'll see you again next time. Thank you. See you at work.